The third lecture of the subject English literature is devoted to the theme English literature of the middle centuries, from 11th to 14th centuries. Objectives of the lecture By the end of the lecture, students should be able to examine different areas of life in medieval England, analyze the impact of changes during the Norman conquest, understand the significance of folklore in England during medieval time. During the lecture, we will discuss the given questions. The first one, characteristics of the medieval period. The second, Norman England. And the third, Early English and Scottish Ballads. The early portion of the medieval period in England is dominated by Anglo-Saxons, whose language is incomprehensible to today's speakers of English. That early portion is known as the Old English period. The Old English period came to an end with the Norman invasion of 1066. Normans spoke a dialect of French, later called Anglo-Norman. The invasion put a French-speaking people at the highest levels of society. Families that ruled England also ruled and held land in France. William the Conqueror was also Duke of Normandy, and the English king continued to hold that office and its land until the 13th library selections. From various centuries will give you a very rough idea of the wide variety of literature circulating in medieval England. At one time, the Middle Ages were known as the Dark Ages, a label which suggests that they represented black pages in the history of Western civilization. But a closer look shows that there were many accomplishments during this time in history. During this period, many important features of our modern world were born, including parliamentary government, common law, present-day languages and modern nation-states. In art, it was a great period for bookmaking, architectural rivalry, and the time of important developments in sculpture. The following characteristics of Middle Ages can be distinguished. It focuses on religion. There were a lot of wars and invasions during the time. There were oaths and pledges between vessels. Feudalism grew. Local lords had economic, military, social, and political power. The Roman Catholic Church had a lot of power. Much of the early literature of this period consists of sermons, prayers, lives of saints, and homilies. In secular medieval literature, the figure of King Arthur, an ancient British hero, attracted the attention and imagination of these early writers. Arthur first appeared in literature in Latin. History of the British Kings around 1147. The majority of books from the Middle Ages were written in what is known as Middle English, though French and Latin were also used for lore and the church respectively. Books were often made by monks and it was a time and labor-intensive process. Everything was done by hand. Making books were very expensive to produce. So, even if a medieval London merchant could read, a personal library of handmade books would have been out of this price range. However, as the middle class grew and literacy expanded in the late Middle Ages, people might have owned a book of hours, prayer book, produced by professional artisans and copiers. Norman Conquest had a considerable effect on English literature. Before this period, English literature was mainly characterized by homilies, religious verses, translations of psalms, parts of the Bibles, lives of the saints, rules for an honest religious life, and prayers. This period was also known as the period of such new genre as fable and fabliaux. Fables were short stories with animals for characters and conveying a moral. Fablio was a short, funny story with men, people, cunning, sly, stupid husband and unfaithful wives. The Normans who conquered England were originally members of the same stock as the Danes, who had harried and conquered it in the preceding centuries. The ancestors of both were bands of Baltic and North Sea pirates, who merely happened to immigrate in different directions. And a little farther back, the Normans were close cousins in the general Germanic family of the Anglo-Saxons themselves. The exploits of this whole race of North Sea 
kings make one of the most remarkable chapters in the history of medieval Europe. In the 9th and 10th centuries, they mercilessly ravaged all the coasts not only of the west but of all Europe from the Rhine to the Adriatic Sea. They settled Ireland and Greenland and prematurely discovered America. They established themselves as the ruling aristocracy in Russia. And as the imperial bodyguard and chief bulwark of the Byzantine Empire at Constantinople. And in the 11th century, they conquered southern Italy and Sicily, whence in the First Crusade they pressed on with unabated vigor to Asia Minor. Those bands of them with whom we are here concerned and who became known distinctively as Normans fastened themselves as settlers early in the 11th century on the northern shore of France and in return for their acceptance of Christianity and acknowledgement of the normal feudal sovereignty of the French king were recognized as rightful possessors of the large province which thus came to bear the name of Normandy. Here, by intermarriage with the na native women, they rapidly developed into a race, which while retaining all their original courage and enterprise took on also, together with the French language, the French intellectual br brilliancy and flexibility and in manners became the chief exponent of medieval chivalry. William the Conqueror led to the Norman conquest of England in 1066. Normans largely removed the native ruling class, replacing it with a foreign French-speaking monarchy, aristocracy and clerical hierarchy. In turn, Normans brought about a transformation of the English language and the culture of England in a new era often referred to as Norman England. In language and literature, the most general immediate result of the conquest was to make of England a trilingual country, where Latin, French and Anglo-Saxon were spoken separately side by side. With Latin the tongue of the church and of scholars, the Norman clergy were much more thoroughly familiar than the Saxon priests had been and the introduction of the richer Latin culture resulted in the latter half of the 12th century at the court of Henry II in a brilliant outburst of Latin literature. In England, as well as in the rest of the Western Europe, Latin long continued to be the language of religious and learned writing, down to the 16th century or even later. French, that dialect of it, which was spoken by the Normans, Anglo-French, it, it has naturally come to be called, was the course introduced by the conquest as the language of the governing and upper social class, and in, in it also during the next three or four centuries a considerable body of literature was produced. Anglo-Saxon, which we may now term English, remained inevitably as the language of the subject race, but their literature was at first crushed down into insignificance. It must not be supposed, notwithstanding, that the Normans, however much they despised the English language and literature, made any effort to destroy it. On the other hand, gradual union of two languages was no less inevitable than that of the races themselves. From the very first, the need of communication with their subjects must have rendered it necessary for the Normans to acquire some knowledge of the English language, and the children of mixed parentage of course learned it from their mothers. The use of French continued in the upper state of society, in the few children's schools that existed, and in the law courts for something like three centuries, maintaining itself so long, partly because French was uh, the polite language of Western Europe. But the dead pressure of English was increasingly strong, and by the end of the 14th century, end of Chaucer's life, French had chiefly given way to it even at court. As we have already implied, however, the English which triumphed was in fact English-French. English was enabled to triumph partly because it had now largely absorbed by the French. For the first 100 or 150 years, it seems the two languages remained for the most part 
pretty clear distinct, but in the 13th and 14th centuries, English abandoning its first aloofness rapidly took into itself a large part of the French vocabulary. And under the influence of the French, it carried much further the process of dropping its own comparatively complicated grammatical inflections, a process which had already gained much momentum when before the conquest. This absorption of the French was most fortunate for English. The Anglo-Saxon vocabulary, vigorous but harsh, limited in extent and lacking in fine discriminations and power of abstract expression, was now added nearly the whole wealth of French with its fullness, flexibility and grace. As a direct consequence, the resulting language, modern English, is the richest and most varied instrument of expression ever developed at any time by any race. During the period after Norman conquest, culture was at its height. Tales and lyrical poems appeared. They praised the gallantry, bravery of noble knights, the heroic deeds and their attitude towards ladies. These works were written at first in Norman French and many stories came from old French sources. The language was a Romanic dialect, so this genre was called Romances. Later in England, such works were called the art of minstrelsy. The number of romances was based on Celtic legends about King Arthur and his knights of the round table. The main characters of this genre, unlike the characters of church, were not saints, but human beings. The worship of fair ladies motivated the plot of these stories. King Arthur was historical figure, the national hero of Celts. He was described as an ideal king, possessing all virtues of a hero. He was honest, wise, fair to all his vassals. They had their meetings at the round table which Arthur built for their feasts, so that all of them should be equal, consequently this notion has come to our days. Folk poetry, especially ballads, enriched English literature. Largely to the 15th century, however, belong those of the English and Scottish popular ballads, which the accidents of time have not succeeded in destroying. We have already considered the theory of the communal origin of these kinds of poetry in the remote prehistoric past and have seen that the ballads continued to flourish vigorously down to the later periods of civilization. The still existing English and Scottish ballads are mostly, no doubt, the work of individual authors of the 15th and 16th centuries, but nonetheless they express the little changing mind and emotions of the great body of the common people who had been singing and repeating ballads for so many thousand years. Really essentially popular too, in spirit are the more pretentious poems of the wandering professional minstrels, which have been handed down along with the others. Just as the minstrels were accustomed to recite both sorts indiscriminately. Such minstrel ballads are the famous ones on the Battle of Chevy Chase or Otterburn. The production of genuine popular ballads began to wane in the 15th century when the printing press gave circulation to the output of cheap London writers and substituted reading for the verbal memory by which the ballads had been transmitted, portions as it were, as a half mysterious and almost sacred tradition. Yet the existing ballads yielded slowly, lingering on in the remote regions, and those which have been preserved were recovered during the 18th and 19th century by collectors from simple men and women living apart from the main currents of life to those hearts and lips they were still dear. Indeed, even now the ballads and ballad making are not altogether dead, but many still be found nourishing in such outskirts of civilization as the cowboy plains of Texas, Rocky Mountain mining camps, or nooks or corners of the southern Alleghenies. The folk poetry flourished in England and Scotland at the end of the 14th and beginning of the 15th centuries. A folk song is a short poem in rhymed stanzas, usually set to melody.
One of the varieties and the most interesting of folk poetry were the ballads. Ballads were for singing or reciting. Very often they were also for dancing. Ballads can be classified into three groups. The first, historical ballads. They were based on a historical events or fact. The second, heroic. They were about people who were persecuted by the law and by their own families, but they made heroic deeds. The third, romantic or lyrical, which described mainly love. Among the most popular heroic ballads were those about Robin Hood. Robin Hood, legendary outlaw hero of a series of English ballads, some of which date from at least as early as the 14th century. Robin Hood was a rebel and many of the most striking episodes in the ballads about him show him and his companions robbing and killing representatives of authority and giving the gains to the poor. The most frequent enemy was the Sheriff of Nottingham, a local agent of the central government. Other enemies included wealthy ecclesiastical landowners. Robin treated women, the poor, and people of humble status with courtesy. A good deal of the impetus of his revolt against authority stemmed from popular resentments over those lords of the forest that restricted hunting rights. The early ballads especially revealed the cruelty that was an inescapable part of the medieval life. In conclusion, we can say, the medieval time was truly fascinating, but it wasn't just dark. All of the Middle Ages was a struggle for many. After the fall of the Roman Empire, a new system called feudalism was made to support Europe. It created a society which then made a nation. The Norman invasion of England in 1066 led to the defeat and replacement of the Anglo-Saxon elite with Norman and French nobles and their supporters. The new rulers introduced a feudal approach to governing England. After the Norman invasion, the position of women in society changed. Ballads were popular from the late 14th century onwards, including the ballads of Chevy Chase and others describing the activities of Robin Hood. This is the end of the lecture. In order to make the revision of it, use the following questions. The first, what year did the Norman conquest take place? The second, who was the leader of the Normans during the Norman conquest? The third, what peoples did the Normans originally come from? The fourth, what is a fable? The fifth, what does a fabio describe? The sixth, what is the folk ballad? The seventh, ballads in England and Scotland in the 14th and 15th centuries were classified into the following groups. What are they? Also, you are given a list of the terms of the lecture and the references for further study.